Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. This has been a great conference so far. Welcome. My name is Allison Maurer. I'm the Scholarly Communications and Copyright Librarian here at Marriott Library. Um, before I introduce the keynote speaker, I've been asked to announce food, lunch. <laughs> it will be available immediately after Dr. First's address. It's going to be in the faculty center, which is just across the lobby here. Um, and then sessions will start again at 12.30 and at 1. Any questions about that? Okay. Great. Today's keynote speaker is Dr. Cynthia Furse. In my experience working with Dr. Furse, I have learned that she is many things. A gifted educator, an accomplished scholar, and a dedicated administrator. First and foremost, she is what I like to call and misspell incorrectly spell an experimentor with an O, not the E. I emphasize the mentor aspect because Dr. First has a keen understanding of the importance of testing an idea or process herself in order to best describe it and show it to others. The res this results in her being one of the top scholars on campus and in her field of electromagnetics and wireless communications. Dr. First has illustrated the experimentor concept by being an early adopter of posting teaching content online all the way back in the 90s, engaging students in hands-on research, and establishing hybrid and flipped courses, many of the topics presented here today and discussed in the New Media Consortium report. I highly recommend her video, A Busy Professor's Guide to Sanely Flipping Your Classroom, available from STEM Central. Dr. Verse's daily contribution to higher education comes on top of a stellar academic career, which includes a PhD in engineering, several awards in teaching and research excellence, and a startup company. I am very honored to introduce Dr. Cynthia Furse for today's keynote address. And I'm actually truly honored to be introduced in that way. I hope, and I made everyone move up towards the front, I hope that you will actually consider me willing to mentor anybody on this planet that wants to try this flip teaching. So please come and talk to me if there is anything that you would, if you'd try this, I will help you try it. So what I wanted to talk about today was actually a bit of my journey because yes, you can go online and see the how-to videos, so I'm only going to very briefly touch on that. And a bit what I'd really like to talk about is what do you want to do with your teaching? So think about that as we go through. Let me see by raise of hand, how many of you are actually instructors or professors on, on campus or around today? Okay, how many of you are tech professionals? Okay, how many of you are students, grad, undergrad? Awesome, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, your voice is very important in this conversation because what we're doing is we're flipping teaching and learning. Both are flipped. Um, I put my website on the bottom, teach-flip.utah.edu, a program sponsored by the National Science Foundation to help you flip your class. We'll have it on the last slide too. Teach-flip.utah.edu. Okay, so what's a flip class? Um, it's a very important new concept, except that what we do is actually good old stuff. Okay, in the old way, class time, we gave a lecture. In my case, I taught students about electromagnetic fields and I gave them all the facts, figures, and equations. They wrote them down very diligently in the notes and never missed a thing. Then they went, <laughs> you don't possibly think they missed any of my great lecture. <laughs> okay, then they went home to do their homework, usually by themselves. 80% of my students study alone. I wish they didn't. I wish they studied together. But 80% of my students study alone. Consequently, everything they missed is now a serious sticking point. They are not going to get their homework done and they are going to show up in my office hours tomorrow morning if they show up in office hours at all, which means my office hours are gonna take me a really long time. Okay, so what we did is we flipped the class. And what that means is the home time, and I'm not even gonna call it homework because most of the students actually say they enjoy this very much. They said, you can't call it homework, it's like home play. Like, really? What they do is they watch my terribly engaging video lectures 
and they take notes, and they answer my question of the day, which is really my learning objective. How do you design, um, how do you calculate the electric field using Coulomb's law? For example, something really enticing like that. <laughs> okay, so they answer that at home, they bring their notes with them to class, and then the magic of the flipped class, this is not an online class. This is not a substitute for a professor. This is augmenting the value of the professor in very substantial ways. What we do in class is, the students work together on a problem. They get stuck. I either get them unstuck individually, most often, I just collect their questions and then I stop the class and answer their questions all together. The students are talking to each other about real stuff. I have time now to bring in the real engineering applications that I frankly value tremendously. That's why I went into engineering in the first place. That's why all of us went in our, into our fields. It was not to read the book. Maybe in English if the book was very beautifully written. Okay? But most of us did not go into the field to sit and read the textbook. We went into the field because of the dynamism of what we're doing in our, in our real life. The fact that I can design antennas inside the human body to be able to solve medical conditions. That's what my freshmen need to feel because that's the career they're headed for. So I have time for that now and I didn't have time before. And the students work together and they actually try out real stuff. And that's pretty cool. So we flipped what used to be inside the class, what used to be outside the class, and what I did was I bought time. So just to give you the quick how-to version, again, if you want more detail, I will be delighted to help you work through this. You do a video lecture. These are three different ways I've done a video. I love my tablet PC because basically I teach math, essentially. So the tablet PC is awesome. You do not see my face in these kinds of videos. I use the um, $69 document camera. I use this right after class to answer a bunch of questions and quickly post them. About 20 minutes I can have answers from class posted up online. And then I also, even before I had a tablet PC, I just used my little home camera, you know, the one that I used to take pictures of my kids. And uh, the whiteboard took video of that too. If I taught French, I would be using the camera on my face because my facial expression would be very important. But I teach engineering and frankly, my face is not as important as the equations. That's why I've chosen the model I use. I then post it up on YouTube publicly. Yes, that was scary. It means that every one of my colleagues through the entire world can see that I left out a factor of two. <laughs> <laughs> which I do on a regular basis, quite accidentally. But fortunately, I can put a comment on YouTube that says there's a factor of two left out at minute 45. Just keep going, guys, come on. <laughs> and then frankly, I'd be happy to advertise Canvas because I love it. I post all my stuff on Canvas and keep the students organized. Okay, so that's what I do. Then, this is what I do in class. Active learning is why I got into this thing in the first place. I, try, I learned about active learning and how valuable it was. It's pretty obvious. If the students are awake and engaged, they're going to learn more. Right, that was kind of obvious to, to even me. Okay, so I tried bringing it into my class, but I didn't have enough time if I had to go through the whole factual lecture and then get to the active learning. So the fact that they now come in with the facts, the information, the theory, means that they have time to work together. And this is, these are literally pictures from one of my classes. It's very active and engaged. It's very collaborative. No, I don't turn them loose by themselves for the whole hour. It's, it's still, I'm still working with a class the whole time. But it's very collaborative. Okay. What the Oops. videos do for you is you're able to pause something you didn't quite get, rewind it, and, and learn at your, at your own speed. And, and so that, that actually, I think, enables everybody to, to learn the material better, so pretty much normalizes the, the learning process. Okay, technical difficulties, but not too bad. I wanted my students to tell with you about With the flipped this. classroom idea, it, it forces me to study beforehand so that I can come up with a list of questions, for example, for Dr. First in the, in the next day's lecture. And then we can have this really dynamic classroom activity where everyone's contributing to the idea that was like presented. You know, for example, like how do you, you, know, how do you um, write an equation for this electric field right here? And everyone can answer along with Dr. First. So it becomes a very, very hands-on activity, I think, in class, which typically it doesn't. We didn't prime these students. They really do recognize that this is a different environment. What you're setting your pace, it's not the professor setting where. Okay, he says you're setting your own pace. Well, guess what? It means I'm not. 
I've given up a lot of control of my classroom to what is the inevitable learning process. The students don't take the control because they wanted to. They take the control because their minds are either learning at that moment or not. The cool thing is, instead of me forcing information across the, across the class as if you were getting it all, when you aren't, I'm able to pick it up very, very quickly. And I know who's struggling very quickly. Even I've had a class of 120 that I'm doing with this. But you can find very, very quickly what the biggest problems are. And the cool thing is you can fix them basically on the spot. Well, I think that it's forced me to be a good student because before I've even come to class, I've already done the lecture and my notebook is full of notes. And so then I'm just asking questions by the time I get to class. Faculty often ask me, why can't I just require the students to read the book? And then they'll come with their, with their lectures, with their, with their notes. Is there a student who would be willing to volunteer and tell me why it's hard to just read the book and come to class prepared? Is there a student who would volunteer to tell me that? Because reading a book is an isolated thing and it's easy to get distracted, or if you don't understand the terms, if you're a skimmer, it's very easy to go right past those things that you don't understand looking for the thing that you do. Absolutely. It's really hard for students to sit and read. Now, you can imagine already that my textbooks are enough to choke a goat, even when they're well written. And so the students all say, I mean, we're down to, I think, one in a hundred students would prefer to read the book first and watch the lecture second. They do read the book, but they watch the lecture first, and that gets them ready to read the book, because then they understand enough of the material to be effective when they hit the choke the goat version. I will watch the videos the night before class, and then, of course, you have questions because you have no idea what was going on in class, this right? Real. But you don't have to worry about it because Dr. First will answer it for you um, the next day. Well, she asks you questions during it, even though during the video. you can't answer it really. You can think about it and you can think, oh, how is this going to, that's obviously going to be important to what she's talking about. So I feel more involved. I thought one thing that um, happened really well, I think part of it is Canvas as well as the videos, is Canvas allowed us to basically post our questions yeah. on a, a Canvas board, and not only were we getting answers from uh, Dr. First, but we were also getting answers from different students. So we were uh, able to kind of um, talk to each other and get to know each other that way, because then in that class, you're like, hey, you answered my question. Hey, I got another one. Uh, so it made it more personalized, as in you got to know the students better, as well as I always knew that when I posted something or emailed Dr. First, she was going to respond and I wasn't going to be um, left out in, in the dark. Uh, for me, English is the second language, so if I don't understand very well the teacher or her accent, I can just watch the videos, I can activate the subtitles, so I can also see the written of what she's explaining about. Uh, I can really, really see the, all the drawings or the graphics or all the formulas she's writing so I can really understand perfectly what's going on. And um, what I also think that in the videos uh, she usually explains all the theory. So then when you go to class you have all the theory knowledge, you take your notes and then she starts to do all the exercises. So it's much easier and faster to understand this. Those are my real students. I didn't bribe them. They actually asked if they could give feedback. And I thought you might enjoy being able to see this from the student's point of view. So before I flipped, that was a normal class. And I would have to ask, as I did when I went on sabbatical before I started changing this, why be normal? If that's our normal, why be normal? Let's not. So I flipped the class. So why did I do this? 2007, um, it was not a standard thing, it didn't have a name. I was calling it no more lecture, although of course there was a lecture, it was outside of class. So why did I flip this class? Now, also I want you to take a close look at my upside down class here. This is the room I'm teaching in. There are 80 students in this class. Like I say, I've had as many as 120. Um, what do you see about this class that might make you worry about doing a flip class? They're all asking questions at the same time. Yes, they are. And in fact, they are answering the questions at the same time. They are both teaching and learning because they're teaching each other. Yes. Anything else? Yes. Um, the, they're stationary chairs and big desks that don't reconfigure you. This is so totally a normal room. Um, I can flip a class in this room, too. 
The truth is, you can't work with very many people at any given time, efficiently, but you can certainly, how many people are next to you? So if you were in my class, I'd say, hey, do you mind just working with her, you guys, you know, and you'll just kind of self-work. Oh, but you're here kind of by yourself. So I would be very likely to say, do you, do you want to just work with him? That's literally how I get the class working together. I just touch shoulders and, ask, and just kind of get people working together. Oh, and then someone, hmm, it's probably you, okay, I'm going to pick on you, says, I really work much better by myself. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I do. I just am really smart. I just really just work by myself. So I say, hey, it's okay. Um, but I will bet you pie at the point that if you work with her, you're going to learn something today. So I'll bet you, and, you, and they, they never have turned me down yet, <laughs> and uh, I've never bought pie. <laughs> <laughs> so if I have a real stickler who absolutely will not work together, I just do this, and pretty soon they'll find a group that they'll work with. Okay, so that's, yep. I have a stationary room, but it works just fine. As long as I've got two people on either side, I've got nearest neighbors, and that's who they work with. So this does not require a special room. Uh, how explicitly do you tell them like, the goals of the activity, or hmm. explain to them, like, study set shown, working together, is oh. it better? I totally am explicit. So at the first day of class, I say this is a flip class. Maybe you've done that before, maybe you haven't. Fortunately, a lot of them hit it in physics and usually like it. So I usually come in with people that have already, at least part of the class has done this. But when I was totally new, I had a page that says, this is a flip class, this is what it is, this is why it is, this is how you can be successful, this is what you're going to find as challenges. I am very explicit. And then as we're going through, all of my lectures say, today I want you to learn how to, de how to derive the electric field using Coulomb's law. I don't, nothing's a mystery. So I am very explicit, and they really respond to that and appreciate it. So I tell them what, that I want them to learn. I tell them this is the learned set in a class. I said, find out your learning style, extra credit, go, go do your learning styles. So I'm very explicit. Okay, there's one other thing I want you to notice. My world has no girls in it, no women, okay? My class of 120 had two women. It's just a little dicey to get those groups to mold, to mold together, but they do. I also anticipate and have been told that one of the things that I can do, because I am one of the few women professors in engineering in the world, honestly, if the video is recorded in my voice, the only voice I have is the girl voice, and that helps a lot of students who aren't even at my university feel like they have a, a full range of genders in, in their professorship. So that's actually helpful. Okay, so why did I flip? The real reason I flipped was because, two reasons. I wanted to help my students get to higher level thinking. We're trying to raise engineers. I was teaching juniors at the time. I want to get them up to the point they can really design stuff and that they love it. So that was one. I just didn't have enough time to get them there. The other thing is, and it kind of fits with this, I wanted to bring in the real world applications and I would keep bringing them and not have enough time to get to them. And I was depressed with that. So I was thinking Bloom's taxonomy I wanted to move them from remembering to understanding to applying, and I felt like we were doing this very well in our program. Analyzing, we had kind of left till the senior year, if you can imagine that, and evaluating and creating they could do for their senior project. Wait a minute, that's the last year. So we weren't, I, I wanted to get them up there at the beginning. So that's why I did it. So when students are watching my videos, they are trying to remember and understand something. They're down here. Then in class, we're trying to improve their understanding and start to apply it. And in fact, we might even be getting to the analyzing stage in that part of the class. But then when I can bring in the real world applications, then we are analyzing, we are evaluating, and they do begin to create stuff themselves, literally in, in the class period or the labs that immediately follow. That's where I was trying to get them. So as a professor, I had to think, what do I really want to do with my students? What is my biggest goal, and why would I bother flipping? You need to, it's, the flipping is not about the video. Everybody thinks that's the most important part, and it isn't. It is a critical part, like you gotta have that to get started, but the important part is what you do in class. That's what's so exciting, and enticing, and fun. And as a professor, and frankly as a student, that's where you really want to imagine. We're an imagined university, right? Imagine what you want to do with your students in class that you don't do today and what that could do to change who they are in your profession. That's what you're after. 
Okay, so what happened? The numbers say that from 2000, which is before I had actually flipped this class, those were my teaching evaluations, which were very good. I was getting teaching awards and all of that. College of Engineering, our teaching evaluations aren't maybe as high as you know, all of them, but, and then I flipped. This particular class that I put the numbers here for, I took a sabbatical in 2008, and this class I flipped between 2007 and 9. Look what happened to my teaching evaluations. I was using the same notes, the same exams, the same labs, the same book. I was the same professor. All I did was flip my class, and I was really new at it. And then they stayed nice and high. And then in these two years, I just want to know, the university actually messed up teaching evaluations and completely changed stuff, so you can't do a comparison there. They aren't the same questions even, so. But that was pretty important. We did a, a survey. This is a freshman class. This is my 120 student class. Let's see what the students think of this. Four weeks into the course, this is we asked them about their opinion of the flip class. Eh, a little more than half were positive, a few more were neutral, and a bunch were negative. Not too many. By the time we got to the end, the majority of students really appreciated the flipped class. There were still some neutrals, and yeah, there were some negatives. In fact, maybe more than there were at the beginning. Here's the deal. The positive students said it made the class time more valuable. They were able to repeat the videos. It was helpful for my ESL students, the and they could slow or speed up the videos. The unsure students said the traditional students still felt like they might have liked a more traditional lecture. In many cases, they said, it's work. It's a lot of work I have to think in class. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> Negative, they say, it's not the way I was taught to learn. It's an interesting method, but it's too easy to fall behind. This puts a lot of responsibility on the student. It really does. Okay, so I wanted to know, remember, I did this because I wanted to move up the level of their learning. So did I? Truth is, I really can't prove if I did or didn't. But here's what I would look at. The test scores are varied. In some flipped classes, you'll see them go up. You never see them go down. My test scores did not change radically. And the reason they didn't was because I was testing at a certain level. I actually wasn't testing to the level where I was now trying to teach. So even though I may now be testing there, I can't go back and look. So I can't prove to you that they are having higher level learning. But if you come to my class, the questions are what have told me that I am teaching at a higher level. It's the biggest thing that most people talk about when they have first flipped their class. They're like, man, these students ask, ask much better questions than they did before. Because they think about it overnight or you know, over the weekend. They come, they actually have really good questions. And we're not talking about where's the factor of two anymore. Now we're talking about my favorite question of all time. Remember, I'm teaching fields. One of the students said, well, so these electric fields, they're not really real, are they? They're just like mathematical constructs, right? <laughs> the answer to that is, of course not. They are real things. They just are invisible things that you can't see, touch, or feel. But they are really real. So it was a super cool question to be able to talk about and discuss. I never got questions like that before. The questions will tell you what level your students are at. Projects. I wanted my freshman students to be able to design a real live project, to do an invention of their own choosing at the end of the semester. Nobody else does this in the country. Last year, I had fabulous inventions because I walked them through this process, lab by lab, week by week, until they were prepared to do a small invention at the end of that semester. So the projects have shown me what they can do. The other thing that was very interesting is I had a colleague who called me up and said, I can't believe how well your students know this particular topic. I'm like, really? He's like, oh yeah, I've never seen anything like it. They corrected me all over the board. And they did. They had corrected him three times or four times in his lecture. He's like, I didn't even know the students knew this stuff. So that was pretty cool. And then I'm trying to get people to stay in electrical engineering, which, believe it or not, can, might, might be a little hard. I actually don't have the numbers on that, so I don't know. The alumni feedback is amazing. When I go to L3, where many of our students are hired, they just accost me in the hall. And they say, oh, Dr. First, look, I've still got my electromagnetics notes here. And oh, I use your videos all the time. And um, they're passed all over the world to professional engineers because engineers are passing good information to other engineers. So I know it's working. But frankly, no, I can't prove it. OK. So let's talk about the title of my talk. I talked about flipped teaching and learning. And that's what we've done so far. But let me describe more of the real human teacher experience. I said I flipped my teaching so my students learn more. The truth is, by flipping my teaching, I have learned a great deal. 
I have become more of a learner in my own world than even I ever was before. So let's talk about that experience. When we have something happen in class like this, these two students were working together, he kind of had a question, I probably bent over to, to, to kind of look at this question with him. I'm sure that's what's happening here. Well, the student behind probably had a light bulb moment. This happens all the time. I'll be answering a question for one student and the other student will go, hey, that's how you do it, kind of thing. I actually get a light bulb moment as well, like, what do you mean these guys don't know that? Why don't they know that? I gave them an excellent lecture. They watched it. It was good, but there are things we don't teach. There are many things that we don't teach, and this is really the guts of our profession. I can teach every one of you here Coulomb's Law, trust me, okay? But to teach you when, why, and how you might want to apply Coulomb's Law is totally a different thing altogether. That is a bottleneck. It's a bottleneck concept. There's actually something called bottleneck concepts. And the, the, the thing here, let me read you the engineering definition of this is, optimizing features in module A, my lecture, or C, my lab, will not, let's say in the performance of the application, will not produce a change until module B is fixed. Most of these bottleneck concepts are not the factors of two in my world. Most of these bottleneck concepts are the real guts of engineering. And guess what? I can't find one book in my entire collection, I have a really big collection, that, does, that talks about a number of these concepts that are so key and critical that are absolutely essential that every good engineer does. But we don't teach a lot of this stuff, which means students find it at various times and eventually they've all got it or else they all dropped out. Okay? But these bottleneck concepts are things that, I, wow, there really are things we don't teach. When you work with your students on what used to be their homework, you're going to discover what you weren't teaching. And that is a real light bulb moment. So for me, it's been a light bulb moment in my world. One of the things we don't teach, we teach circuits. And they look as confusing to the students as they do to you. Okay? We teach circuits, and we teach them to put all these circuits together with all of these parts and they build something, and then we wonder why they can't build something new of their own invention. The part that we didn't teach them, which all good engineers do, is to think of the system design first. I want to multiply and add up a couple of things. You can understand that, of course, right? And I can put these things that can be all multiplied and added together. I can think this, and then I can design this. And we don't teach that, believe it or not. So that was a light bulb moment for me, that there was something in my discipline that was key to engineering that we don't teach. Okay, there's stuff in your discipline too. And when you start teaching this way, you actually do discover it, it's cool. Okay, now here's another thing that I, have, that I feel very passionate about. I'm at this university because I want to teach. I love my students. I want them to be tremendous engineers. I went into engineering to change the world. And I am not joking about that one iota. One of the best ways that I can change the world and design and develop things to improve medicine, transportation, air pollution, poverty, third world challenges, the way I can do that best is to reach my class of 120 students and make each of them not only fabulous engineers, but also intensely involved individuals in our world. And that's why I'm there, not a robotic automaton. Okay, so I want to have world impact. Impact in my world means a lot of engineers around the whole world working to solve our world problems together. So open access to me gave me open impact and I had no idea the extent to which this would happen. I put it up on YouTube because it was handy because at the time, the university does now, but at the time the university didn't have an easy place for me to put my videos. So up they went on YouTube. Five minute limit, which ended up being brilliant. Um, so let's just look at the last 30 days. I have 72 students in my class watching videos. I have had 39,000 views in the last 30 days. What are the odds those are my students? <laughs> Small fraction of my current impact is my current class. Over the lifetime, which is not very long, I've had over two million views. I am impacting a lot of engineers around the world. Let me give you a particular story that actually made me very happy 
because this is why I'm an educator. So a couple of years into this class that I was teaching, it's a junior level electromagnetics class, I was contacted by email by a young professor in Islamabad, Pakistan. At the time we were at war to, with Pakistan. Totally legal for them to see this kind of information, we're all okay with that. But he's trying to educate his students the same way I'm trying to educate my students. And he writes to me and says, we have a serious problem with this class. Less than 50% pass the class, have to redo it, and sometimes they're out of the program as a result. No students in my 60-person class have ever gone on to do a senior design project in electromagnetics. They hate it. Electromagnetics, the class I teach, happens to be the least popular class internationally in the electrical engineering curriculum, just so you know. And, I'm not, and we do know about this for a fact. Okay, so he's teaching the least popular class in the curriculum, and he has a 50% success rate. So he said, what shall I do? I said, well, and also he's not an electromagnetics expert. He's actually a circuits expert. Lucky guy. So I said, well, you have nothing to lose. <laughs> Why don't you just try using video lectures from me and any others that you find, find that you like? And why don't you just flip your class? So he emailed me back and forth every you know, week or two for about a couple of weeks, kind of talked about what he was doing in class and how it was working, and then I didn't hear from him. I thought, oops, <laughs> screwed that one up. <laughs> that isn't working out so well. But at the end of the semester, he wrote back to me. And he said, in my class of 60, 100% passed the class, and six went on to do projects in electromagnetics. That is global impact. That is pretty darn cool. So that to me was an impact that I wanted to have in my professional career. Now the interesting thing that I also found from this was you know that when you, you know, you love, to, you love at lecturing in front of students. They feed back to you. You know when they're interested because they're watching, right? And they're writing and they get kind of excited. It's really a very engaging social experience, right? At least for you. Okay, so I have been very surprised that students describe this method using the word intimate. They say when they are watching my my lecture, which is like writing, and they don't see my face at all, thank goodness. Okay, they see only my writing and they hear only my voice. And I've had many students say, it's like you're right at my elbow. It's as if you were here just for me. So the bizarre thing to me was, the less you see of me, the more they feel me. Otherwise, think about it. If you're taking a video from the back of the class, which in fact someone is, there's a great deal of separation in many, many people between you and the professor but not if you're right there on your computer, right? If it's right there with you, it's very intimate. And they have used this word over and over. So I have been very surprised at the intimacy that students feel from this method, the personal connection that they feel. Okay, that's cool. But here's the other thing. I had no idea how compelling that would be for me, how much it matters to me <gasps> and how much it matters to them. I've had students in this 120 person class, and yes, I know their name, but barely. I do not know these guys. They have come up in the hall many times and said, Dr. First, you changed my life. I'm like, really? <laughs> That's great. But the truth is, being intimate is how you change people's lives. And sometimes, from afar, you can be, in fact, intimate. So I have been very surprised how that has impacted me as well. So remember, what I said we were doing in class, the reason I did this was to get to my holy grail of the taking engineers from the remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, to being able to create something wonderful. And to me, that's why I flipped my class. Did I do that? The answer is clearly yes from my world. Although I can't give you the numbers, you will just have to accept that the fantastic questions, the great projects, and the involvement of the alumni after the fact mean that this method is creating creators. And that's what I set out to do. One of the things that you become very aware of when you teach in this way is I am getting right where the students are. I am touching the students. You know, shoulder, papers, whatever. Don't be afraid to reach out and touch your students, both intellectually, both career-wise, and in fact, in your class. Don't feel that you must be safely behind that front row. This is 
a very intimidating thing to do at the beginning. It feels a little hard to walk up to someone and truly make eye contact with them and look at their paper and know what they are doing. It is intimidating that first time when you realize you have no idea how to do that problem. What do you mean you don't know how to do that problem? That's very intimidating. And having a student ask you a question that you didn't have prepared lecture notes for is very intimidating. But I will tell you that that is magical as well. Getting out of that comfort zone and away from the, you know, sitting in the front row of the class is very intimidating and it's incredibly rewarding. So please don't be afraid to reach out and touch your students in all of the ways that you would like to as an educator. So I talked about, I started with the title of Flipping Teaching and Learning. And what I wanted you to know is that this has made me more of a learner and less, uh, I mean, I think as much of a teacher, but it has really flipped the teaching and learning experience for me. We received, Donna Ziegenfuss at the Marriott Library and I received a grant from the National Science Foundation last year to create an online program to help faculty flip their classes. The business end of doing this. It's teach-flip.utah.edu. We've run this now twice as a MOOC. It's just finishing. We'll continue to run it every semester, I believe, as a MOOC to help faculty flip their classes. The cool thing about a MOOC is you can experience and talk education with, in the first case, about 700 faculty from around the world. This is interesting. Because you can find out what others are doing and how they are doing it, how they relate in your discipline, <coughs> this has been pretty cool. The materials are here that you can use, like self-serve, but also if you care to join the MOOC for next semester, just, you know, we'll put a link there pretty soon to sign up again. I also will be delighted to have anyone who would like to come and visit my classroom is welcome to come. Just contact me personally. I'm on the Teach-Flip website. Contact me personally. A good day, one good day, is March 13th. That's Digital Learning Day. And I, I want you to contact me personally because I want to send you the online stuff uh, in advance so that you're not completely lost. So you can actually come in and design op amps with the best of them. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll be able to. So uh, do, do contact me. That's one good day to come and visit the class. So please reach out, touch your students, and feel free to flip your class. Thank you. for the flip class. I, I used my sabbatical to uh, catch my breath from the last 10 years of my career. I was reinventing my research and I also, I just had the feeling that I wanted to change my teaching. I had done some flipping in 2007, but I hadn't seen how to flip a full large undergraduate class. So I really was just thinking about it. I did not have any time or help to flip. I was just teaching a regular class of 78 students at the time while I flipped it the first time. My advice to a, an early flipper is flip the last third of your class first. Okay? Do not try to flip the whole thing because the students will not let you stop and it is exhausting to flip the entire class, to prepare materials for an entire semester. But the last third is what? Five weeks? It's really four weeks because kind of last week is a review. So four weeks of material, anyone can live on adrenaline. We, we generally do. It, at first, when I was preparing video lecture, I teach in 50-minute increments, it would take me two or three or four hours to prepare those lectures, even though I had notes ready. But really quickly, I decided that was unsustainable, and I got rid of the Walt Disney version. And if I left a factor of two out, I left a factor of two out. I just make a note later. Um, and now I can prepare lectures. My 50-minute segment will shrink to about 20 minutes, and I can do that in about an hour. So you will get very efficient really fast because you will have to. Um, and like I said, flip the last third, then the next year flip the two thirds, and then flip the whole thing. Also, it's really wise to flip a class you've already taught so you're tuned in to the students and you know what level to flip. I did that with a freshman class. I had never taught it before. It was a truly great experience, but I wouldn't do it if I'd never flipped. How do you get them to do the pre-class work? 
you grade it or what, what do you do? That is a totally fantastic question. How do you get them to watch the videos? So I've been asking in this freshman, these are freshmen, these are baby students, right? Freshman students. I have been asking in class multiple times, how many have watched the videos? 90 plus percent are watching the videos. And I ask them, why do you watch the videos? And the top answer is always. I mean, they'll raise their hands, they'll say this. They say, because we want the information, we need it. We're excited about electrical engineering. This is how we learn the stuff. Your videos need to have the value in them that helps them learn. So keep them short and sweet and put in the valuable information that they need. No fluff, okay, that's one. The second part is, I remember I said I have a learning objective, and I could say it's a learning objective. I call it the question of the day. It is the same thing. It's my learning objective for that day. It's, it's at the top of my video. It's the title of the day, Coulomb's Law. And I, I ask them to answer this question of the day in their own words. They can use those notes on the exam, but they can't use their textbook. So they're writing their own textbook. And I do give them points for turning that in at the beginning of class. So is it graded? Yes, but I will tell you that if they never did one question of the day, they would lose less than one half of a grade. So they would not go from an A to an A minus if they never turned in a question of the day. It is an insignificant number of points. It's given to them just to get them started, but it's an insignificant number of points. I tell them that too. I say, this is gonna change your grade, but if you do it, you will learn and your grade will change. So they, I think, are generally doing much of the learning for the very right reasons. There are professors that give quizzes in class and stuff. I don't have time. So, okay, very good question. Another question? You touched briefly on accessibility and ways it can benefit um, students with disabilities. Um, how spe what specifically do you do to make those videos or slideshows accessible, especially in terms of like formulas and things? Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so accessibility for students with disabilities, let's address that first, and then let's, let's talk about accessibility for like everybody. So I have had a profoundly deaf student in my class, the kind who receives the, the translator um, paid for by federal funding, so profoundly deaf. Um, and at the time, the disability center hired someone to close caption all of my videos for him. Now YouTube will close caption them for you. They do a pretty tolerable job. So there are a few words off. It's, it's good enough that everybody can use it, and the ESL students really like it. So my profoundly deaf student said, this is the only time I've been able to, watch, to see a professor's lecture like everybody else. So he could read the subtitles, which went right along with you know, my drawing. So it was really quite effective. That was good. And like I say, YouTube will now close caption them. OK, a little, a little grungy, but not bad for you. So that's one. The students who are visually impaired would, be, would have a problem with this method because I don't, I don't talk out how I write my equations. So if I end up with a visually impaired student, I will have to go back and put in closed captioning enough that they can, re they can hear my equations. Now for the students that are just like regular students, like all the rest of you know, us who are neither hearing impaired nor visually impaired nor any other impairment that I know about, I still need to, I still need to make sure, oops, it's saying that I'm supposed to be at the Digital Scholarship Lab. Um, <laughs> it needs to, uh, so for all of the rest of us, just being able to see it clearly is really important. So I told you about the three different ways I've done the, the lectures. One is with the tablet PC. That's actually my favorite because it is the clearest for equations. They can see it and they can hear me and I can talk about it. I can circle things, I can point at stuff. So I really like the tablet PC best. But for really quick things or to demonstrate lab equipment where I have physical stuff I want them to see, I love my little document camera. The tr only trouble is my hand is inclined to get in the way of the equation. So accessibility means you've got to be able to see it. The third method is actually what I did first because my tablet PC was on back order in 2007. I don't know if you remember, it was hard to get tablet PCs. Okay? It didn't come and it didn't come. That's why I flipped the last third of my class because it didn't come and it didn't come and I was down to the last third. I'm like, dang, I'm going to try this thing. So I put my camera on a tripod, my whiteboard in the you know, office, and I just did the stupid thing. Okay, that was great except that the videos I have are totally clear, but as soon as I upload them to YouTube, it compressed them. And YouTube likes to show things that are moving, not things that are holding still. So my hand is in great, <laughs> in great, but you know, it's not blurry at all, but my equations got blurry. I had to take snapshots of all of my boards to make sure that they could be well seen. 
Does that, is that the kind of accessibility you meant? Okay. What did I learn from the MOOCs? The thing that I learned from the MOOCs is actually came out after we almost finished teaching this last one, which was data that said most people taking MOOCs are actually teachers. Okay, so with a MOOC, so many people judge themselves on, in their MOOC by if someone came in and did every single assignment and came out the other end, never mind if they got what they wanted. By asking faculty what they wanted coming in, we found a lot of people, like frankly, I'm gonna use Jason as an example in the back, okay? Jason is an administrator at Salt Lake Community College and he's responsible for a lot of faculty teaching. He's probably not gonna sit and watch every dang video in, in my MOOC, but he needs to know what's in there so he can provide it as a resource to faculty. The fact that he knows it and likes it and provides that as resource to, how many faculty do you think he might have provided that to? I think uh, we have about a dozen or 20 faculty. Okay, five. who were literally doing it. All right, the fact that he put 20 faculty into this and that we're gonna have, let's say, 20 classes coming out, that's a success. But if I looked at the number, I would say Jason, you know, would have failed my MOOC. Okay, don't judge yourself by the come in and complete. Judge yourself by, did you deliver what each individual person, this is individualized learning, did you deliver what they wanted? So that was a very important thing from the MOOC. The other really, like I say, compelling and fascinating thing was, I was talking with faculty hundreds from around the world. It gave me a lot more perspective on the variety of classes that are taught. Remember, I'm teaching a STEM discipline, but then you're dealing with languages and humanities and history, I know it's in humanities, um, and chemistry, and the different ways these are all taught. So the humanities folks and the language folks said, what is this flip stuff? We've been doing this forever. Like, really? Of course they have. How else do you learn French? You go to class and you speak French. They've been doing this forever. And their discussions about how to get students engaged with each other actually helped me understand some new tricks that I could use with mine. So that was very good. And then also the international aspect. People in South America saying, well, our students don't accept this because, or people in Asia saying, well, they watch videos just for fun so they can learn English gave me a variety that was an international sp perspective I otherwise would have missed. So I think that was a terribly rich discussion that we got through these MOOCs that was very helpful. And we had a bunch of K-12 educators. Guess what? Um, you and I, and I'm using this loosely, are never taught to teach. I never had a class in teaching. Who did? How many had a class in teaching? Hardly any of us had a class actually in teaching. And I, yet, I'm expected to teach the worst class in, electro, in electrical engineering, which is one of the most difficult disciplines on the campus, and I've never been taught to teach. But the K-12 educators have been. So the K-12 educators in our MOOC were constantly bringing in information out of their books, saying this is why this learning thing works, and this is why this learning thing works. That helps give you the theory that I never took a class in. That was the other cool part of the MOOC, that I got a bit of teaching education really fast. Good question. Any other questions? I didn't really want to ask, but um, I teach online. How does this, like I've already made videos and things, I do a lot of what you've shown, but as far as the in-person, how do you do that with an online? That is a, that's, that's actually an open question. How do you turn this into an online class? So I actually have used my materials from my in-person flipped online in two ways. The reason I did it in 2007, I didn't go through that whole detail, but I had a student who was deployed. That's why I made the videos in the first place, because this student got deployed to Iraq, I believe, Afghanistan, probably by 2007. He got deployed mid-semester. He's like, it's my last class. I could graduate if only I finished the last six weeks of this class. So one of his buddies brought the video camera, we just videotaped this, this silly thing, and sent it off to him, and the other students wanted it too, and I started flipping because I had videos. Okay, that was accidental. I'm not really as brilliant as I seem. <laughs> no. These accidental things sometimes lead to really cool options. Okay, so I taught him online, and then the next year I had, I did the numerical analysis class, and I had videos for that. The following year, I didn't have time to teach it because I took the VPR position. So it wasn't in my teaching schedule, but there was demand for it. So we just hired a TA. The students watched the videos, and the TA just kind of did office hours once a week. So given the online stuff, Here's what I do know, and then I definitely suggest you be get in the online community and get some good ideas about how to get students involved. 
a lot of this, the faculty and MOOCs were doing online. The students need to interact with you and with each other. So you need to set up specific opportunities that they do that have high value for doing that, not group work that's busy work. So why do they need to talk to you? They need to talk to you or me because you are really, what do you teach? Uh, library research. Library research. Okay, you're a librarian. And you, and you went into library science because you love it and because it fascinates you and because you can change the world with books and information, right? They need to know that from you. They need to know why I went into electrical engineering. They need to feel that. They need the engineer. They need the librarian. They need the chemist. Librarian. 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 <laughs> Never mind, I know what you are. Librarian, librarian. okay. <laughs> they need the librarian in the world to teach them to be a librarian. So they need that from you, which means putting up a post something like, Here's what we did today. We learned about, okay, the, I, the only thing I know about librarians, that's not true. Um, but let's take the Dewey Decimal System. We learned about the Dewey Decimal System today. No? <laughs> okay, history. <laughs> that was funny. Um, okay, give me a topic you teach. Copyright. Copyright. I know about, yeah, okay. I know, le what I know about copyright is call Allison. <laughs> okay, so if you want to teach about copyright, yeah, you're going to teach a whole lot of facts and, and figures and, you know, how you get them approved and who does, who's green, yellow, and red and all that kind of stuff, right? That's what you're going to teach. Okay, I'm not going to say who cares, but what I mean is why do I care about that? What's the, what's the controversy today? There's plenty of controversy over copyright. What's the new and interesting stuff? What's coming up? What might come up? What could they imagine could come up? What would happen if, what would, how would they feel if their copyright got abused in this way and that? That's what they need from you. What do they need from each other, okay? So from each other, they are all learning copyright. They're all new to copyright. They haven't learned this before, let's say. Okay, they're all new to this. So what do they need from each other? Well, when people who are just learning something come together, one of two things happens. A student who picks something up quickly can help to teach a student who is a little bit slower. That's one. I don't know that you're going to run into that an awful lot with copyright, but certainly you do in my field. So in chemistry, you're going to have a lot of interaction back and forth of, for example, find the possible questions that could happen in this method. What could go wrong with this method of analysis we're doing? What could go wrong in a copyright evaluation? So helping students collect the questions that they and others might have is one thing they can do very well as a group. That's one. The other thing is sharing thoughts and ideas, which I think absolutely applies to copyright because we know a lot of these things are kind of gray areas, right? Is it 10%? No, what do you mean 10.8%? Don't you mean 9.2%, right? Okay, a little bit gray. So having students talk through the gray areas so that they get experience with the grayness is also a very good thing. So you saw my students. These are engineers. They don't like to write, by the way. Um, they hate to write. They were enjoying the discussion boards quite a lot because they could interact with each other. I did not require it, but if I did an online class, I sure as heck would. They like the interaction with each other, and they need the interaction with you. So that's what, oops, that's what I would say about an online class is it's not the discussion board that's magic. It is what do you want to teach your students and why? Who can teach that to them and how? And that's what you make in the discussion boards. It's not the discussion board, it's what you chose to teach that is the magic. Good question. So, so what did you do? You spoke to it a little bit about changing the student's attitude and the subject. Do you actually try to incorporate that into your lectures and actively think about how you can get them excited about the group Heck yes. <laughs> okay, so do I, I want, to t I want to change my students' attitude. Yes, I do. Because why else, I mean, they could just go do an online program from Arizona State. Why me? Well, because I care about the world. I really like bioelectromagnetics. I want my electrical engineers to be able to design a better pacemaker for my dad, your dad, me, when it's needed. So I do talk about it. My real world applications give me an opportunity to share the real engineering and the engineering dilemmas and the engineering challenges and the, and the beauty of engineering. I absolutely want 10 minutes a day at least that I can brainwash 
<laughs> my students. Now, I know for a fact that my freshmen come in because I asked them, and they are scared and uncertain about their choice of profession. Almost to a student, almost every student is uncertain about this frightening thing that's going to take them five and six years and way more money than they ever had in their pocket. It's scary. And I want them to know that this is the right profession for them and why. Or if it isn't, I want them to know that too. If I only teach them equations, they don't know what it feels like to be an engineer. And so they don't actually, they will make a bad decision based on wrong information. Because if you receive wrong information, you will make a bad decision. You will. So if the decision is, if the electrical engineer spends all of their time doing algebra in a notebook, I don't think I like it. Well, I don't think I do either. They need to feel it, so I must help them feel it. So 10 minutes a day, my applications, I am trying to help them feel what it's like to be an engineer. So you okay. said you only had Oops, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We're actually going to need to break for lunch now. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Burst, for speaking.